The platform is designed for easy use. Essentially, project authors use the hypergeo.net web interface to assemble geographic coordinates, latitude and longitude, a trigger radius, and URL references to the locations of internet media. Each of these creates a single point. In turn, a point thus described can be uh, added to other points, uh, multiple points put together and assembled into larger uh, walking projects. Let's take a quick tour of the web interface. After logging in, the user is presented with the Your Projects tab, in which all of the user's projects are listed in tabular format. The radio button under the editing column denotes the, co the project that's currently open for editing, and it can also be used to select the listed projects for editing. A delete button is present in each row for deleting projects. The is public column indicates whether or not the particular project has been released uh, to the public search engine, and there are also columns for the name and description of the project. New projects can be added with the new project button or through the advanced feature of uploading a GPX file to the server that will not be discussed here. Now let's look under the Edit Selected Project tab. Here we see the main project editing interface. Note that there are fields and checkboxes for the project name, description, and release status, all of which correspond to the items that we saw back on the Your Projects page. Note also on this page a radio group indicating options for project type, and these options are route and waypoints. In a route, the order in which the points are added to the columns below is important because the HyperGeo Android application will try to lead the user through these points in that order from top to bottom. In other words, in a route, HyperGeo will lead the user to the first point first, and then the second point, and so on. It will also never play the media for any of the other points out of the order that is specified by the author. Waypoints projects are quite different in that there is no particular order to the points, and Hyper the HyperGeo Android app will happily assist the users in visiting the presently closest point to them, and alternatively, it's happy to play the media for any of the points that the user gets close enough to. This in turn brings us to the importance of the radius setting for each point. If the radius is set to 15 meters, users will need to get within 15 meters of the geographic coordinates to trigger the media. If it is set to 1,000 meters, obviously the media will trigger over a very large area. Authors will find that the radius setting has important aesthetic consequences. Thus, trying different radius settings is something worth experimenting with. Note also that each row has an Actions menu, and these actions allow you to do things like add a row, delete a row, or insert rows into various places in the table. The image, audio, and video text boxes in each column hopefully require a little explanation. You simply paste the URLs of your media into these boxes. YouTube URLs are ideally truncated to include only the V question mark V equals parameter value, uh, but this is even not strictly required. One thing to note here is that when the Android HyperGeo application finds a nearby project and you choose to download it and play it on your mobile phone, what happens is, is that uh, the HyperGeo Android application pre-caches the image and audio files locally on the mobile device. This allows users to download complete projects while they are still in a free wireless zone, and then carry the phone outside of the network data coverage area and still be able to play the projects with the images and the audio. Video, by contrast, is always streamed directly from the internet. Video is never cached by HyperGeo. It is important to understand, then, that the users of the HyperGeo Android app will have the option of turning off video play. This is because 
Some data plans in urban scale 3G and 4G wireless environments are actually really very expensive, and video downloads can eat through a user's data quota very quickly. Thus, if the Android Hyper Geo app discovers that either the user has turned off the video option or that an internet connection with which to stream that video is not available, it will automatically revert to showing whatever image or playing whatever audio media has been provided by the author for that particular point. This concept of media defaulting downward uh, to the next lowest type is a fundamental concept in Hypergeo. In other words, if video is not available, Hypergeo will automatically play any audio or show any image that has been made available by the author. If these are not available, a generic sound will be played and a generic image will be shown. If only audio data is available, it will play um, and Hypergeo will show the default Hypergeo image and so on. Thus, if you're using video, it is still a very good design strategy to also include an image and audio files as sort of backups. For example, you might show a single frame from the video that you intended them to view and the audio taken from that video for any users who don't have access to affordable urban scale 3G or 4G network coverage. It is also important to note that the platform does not currently include any capacity for media storage, as in uploading media to our rented servers for distribution is not yet an option in Hypergeo. Authors must host their own images and audio files on their own websites and then add the working URLs pointing to those files into the Hypergeo project editor. This makes Hypergeo in the classroom an ideal project to follow the, the creation of personal websites that are deployed to web servers with the help of FTP. And this is because students already understand not only how to create such web media, but they also know how to post it to the internet. This said, the Walking Tools project is currently evaluating the feasibility of operating the Hypergeo.net website in general which is hosted on the Google, Google App Engine platform, which in turn charges us for everything, including data processing, serving data, and long-term media storage. Our goal is to find the correct economic and technological model that will keep hypergeo in essentially free to any person or teacher who wants to use it. So whether we add features for uploading and the storage of project media or move toward uh, a donation model that will help us pay for increased server bills, or a premium service model of some type, or whether we find some other form of financial support. These are all things that we're working on, that we're thinking about, and that are going to be ultimately solved as we proceed with the project.